Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider. This is our weekly show every Thursday from 3 to 3.30 talking about association issues. And as you may know and you've heard before, about one third of our population, actually 37%, lives in some form of association. And each week we discuss issues related to that living for owners and board members alike to try to help educate you and help you understand association living. One of the major issues in our industry has been energy. What do we do about saving energy? And people feel sometimes that condos don't have much opportunity and we occasionally hear the word solar. So I'm invited today as my guest, a good friend of mine, Kareem Alana, very experienced from Alana Buick Burrs, has great expertise in energy issues, among other things, to be our guest in the show. And I'd like to welcome Kareem to the show. Welcome. Hello. Can you tell us a little about yourself personally and about your company background? Absolutely. Um, I started this company about 30 years ago and uh, built on sustainability, making construction, buildings last longer, and uh, making them more efficient. And so our specialization includes the exteriors of buildings because that's how buildings weather and age from the outside in, and as well as making them more efficient, such as energy efficient, uh, mechanically efficient, and, and efficient to maintain and operate. And your company has offices in Hawaii, elsewhere? I mean, where are you, where are you generally located? We have uh, 10 branch offices, <clears throat> and they're located in four different states. Hawaii is our second largest office. Our main office in, in Palo Alto, California. <clears throat> and uh, other offices in southern and, and other northern, part, northern California areas, uh, Seattle, Washington, um, Las Vegas, as well as on the East Coast and Carolinas. So, in Hawaii, since you're represented in Hawaii, we hear all the time the word solar. Well, the solar makes sense in, for condos and, and why? Yeah, solar definitely makes sense. Uh, there's lots of sun in Hawaii, and the cost of energy is so incredibly high that solar makes more sense here than just about anywhere in the country. And when you look at you know, solar from, from that perspective, I guess it would be safe to say it'll work for some projects or other, some buildings and not for others just because of the general design of the building. Is that kind of a safe thing to say? It is a very safe thing to say. If you're looking at a high-rise building and you have a rooftop area where you can put solar, the, the high-rise building is so dense in terms of consuming energy there's no way you can consume much of anything on a rooftop of a high-rise building. But if you're on a low-rise type building, three or four stories, it's spread out, there's enough rooftop space available and, and carport space available where you can, you can actually install it. So both of those things have to be there. I've seen in some cases where high-rise, larger buildings, what they do is they actually build, a, I'm going to call it an atrium or ceiling over the parking area, the open parking area, to create the roof space for the solar. You know, have you seen that or is... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, a lot of our, our parking is underground or multi-story, and it doesn't work for that. But if there's open parking and it's open to the sky, you can definitely put shade structures, what we call straight shade structures, where uh, you've got solar panels that are actually providing some shade for, for parking, as well as providing electricity. So you just need the horizontal space available open to the sky. So when a board of directors has that issue, they want to save energy, obviously that's very good. And I should point out one thing, that our legislature has adopted laws within the condo association world that you know, the, the board has to allow solar for individual owners, for example, in a townhouse type property. Granted, there are certain conditions and rules and there's roof sharing and other issues that come up, but in general, our state totally supports condo associations of developing energy programs and makes it difficult for them to deny an owner to install their own solar, for example, on townhouse, unless it uh, doesn't meet certain criteria, which is fair and reasonable in that area. But uh, going back to the, the solar thing, so the board is thinking about solar. I, I guess the first thing they should do is hire a professional to uh, and analyze it. And if so, that's what you do. And what do you do when they, you're, you're asked to analyze something? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, part, part of how sold solar is expensive. And the way solar becomes affordable is through tax credits. There are federal tax credits available of 30%. 
and, and state tax credits available of 35%. So 65 cents on the dollar that's put into the project, you get back as tax credits. But homeowners association, as you know, are nonprofit organizations and they can't take tax credits. So how you fund it and how you monetize the tax credits is complicated in addition to the technical nuances of the solar system itself. So, you know, combined with both of these things, you really should have a, a consultant that's a third party that can give the, uh, the association advice on, on how to go about doing this. Before discussing the financing options, just in general, when you look at someone comes to the solar project, without getting too technical, what are the general things you look at in evaluating their energy needs? And maybe it goes beyond solar to include lighting retrofit and other type of energy savings. But what do you, when, you, when you're asked to look at a project, what are the basic things you look at and how do you approach the project? So, so the basic approach is, is master planning. You, instead of just going in and installing a solar system that's to size what your consumption is today, and often you can't even do that anyway, but if you, if you just did that, and tomorrow you decided to change your light bulbs out and, and make it you know, LED, uh, or change your chiller system and make it more efficient, then you'll be overproducing. Solar is very expensive, and, and overproducing solar doesn't pay at all. So you want to size it appropriately. You want to do the energy planning, know what efficiency measures are coming up, or what you may be installing in the next few years, and then account for the proper sizing. And so you do that, your, your team and, uh, does that planning and comes back with a recommendation to the board on here are the energy opportunities, here are the savings, here is the budget costing of this. Obviously, you got the bid, but uh, um, but there could be you know when you look at bids, you know the, my concern always is you don't always get the best value for the lowest price. Right. And so when you're doing solar, I'm sure you're looking at other things besides just solar works technically, mathematically, and we're going to do the specs. We're going to bid it out. I'm sure. There's a lot of other issues like the quality of the panels that may affect all of this. Absolutely. Uh, and again, it depends on the type of, if you're purchasing outright, if you're leasing it, if you're doing a PPA. Those things matter for the quality of the product. You know, when, when you have more of an ownership stake in the system, you have more uh, uh, reason to expect higher quality. You want something that's going to last 30 years or more. You, you're going to consistently produce power. The power does degrade over time, roughly about a 1% a year degradation. And so that is typically built into the calculations that you do. Uh, but panels can go out. You'd have to replace them. They're very expensive. Uh, inverters, there's another part that lasts between 5 and 10 years that has to be replaced every so often. Panels have to be cleaned. And so there's a, just a lot of things. And you may install a panel uh, on a roofing system. And then, and you have to replace the roof in 10 years or five years. Now, the cost of the roof may go from $200,000 roof replacement to $400,000 roof replacement because you have to deal with all the dense solar that's installed on top of the roof. You've just added that burden on top of your, so there's a lot of planning that goes into it. Is it important that they, uh, I'm going to just assume all solar panels are not the same. Some are made of a higher quality, for lack of a better way to describe it, and maybe have better warranties on it. So, uh, the fact that we see all these advertisements and some of them are, are, are very low in price, it doesn't mean all so I, I don't comment on it. Are, are all solar panels the same or some better, better producers, more efficient, longer warranties, or are they all pretty much the same? No, they're not all the same. They're, they're, there are what we call first tier panels. They may be produced in China, but they are first tier panels versus second, third tier pan panels. And so the quality does vary. And within the quality, it's like how often these panels go out. And who is there to replace them under warranty? See, if you have a 10-year warranty on the system and you're buying it from some source and then this is a small little manufacturer that goes out of business in five years or doesn't have the financial wherewithal because the product they sold is all defective and everything has to be replaced and they just don't have the money to replace it. Now, if you bought it from like Samsung or a large entity like this and they had a warranty and they had a recall, they could afford to spring $30, $40 million to replace a certain number of panels and survive. So warranties don't mean anything unless there's somebody really there to back it up. And, and better built panels, it, there's no substitution because it's not down, you're not losing energy, you're not, you're not, it's not you know, interrupting 
your plan of, of having a successful saving money? It's a theoretical, I mean, because I know a little bit about seller, but that's certainly not my expertise, um, that you could have a house or a, a unit that needed solar panels, that one company, you may need less solar panels just because they're more energy efficient in creating energy. Yeah. Is there any truth to that being a possibility? Or? Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. The amount of the sizing of the solar, like we were talking about, is, is very important. But there are panels that are more efficient. And each year, the efficiency of the panels they, goes up by approximately 3%. And so does the cost. So you're not getting the types of leaps and bounds efficiency as we were getting with uh, you know, Intel making microprocessors where they were doubling in, in capacity and size and speed every 18 months. Solar is a very gradual increase in, in, in efficiency and quality, and it's been roughly 3% a year over the last 10 years. And one of the other things I've heard on occasion is that uh, uh, we can't put solar panels on because if we had a hurricane, they'd all be wiped out. And I realize there's different levels of hurricane. Are there standards of meeting certain minimum wind criteria or uh, recognize that if you have the catastrophic Hurricane 5, maybe nothing will save us, you know? I've often said to my condo clients when who are in flood zones that if that ever happens, you build an ark, mm -hmm. you know, because it's such catastrophic. You can't control the most catastrophic event. But are there basic standards for wind resistance that, you know, the likelihood of a windstorm or a small hurricane would uh, you'd be okay? Or oh yeah, absolutely. By code, you're required to build everything to withstand a certain amount of wind speed, depending on where you are within the islands and which island you're on. But roughly, it's, it's in the 125 miles an hour wind is what you're really designing for. So it's a pretty severe condition, and it is a hurricane force wind, and everything on your building really ought to survive to some extent, and, and certainly the new solar system ought to survive that kind of wind. I would say to you, and I'm a, I'm a big proponent of energy efficiency, and it's not related to a condo, but on my own personal house, I installed a 15 kilowatt PV system, and that, before I did that, my electric bill was, let's so say, six or seven hundred dollars a month, and then I had a car and electric, uh, or the gasoline was another three hundred dollars a month. Let's just call it a thousand dollars a month, and I took the time to put it in, got my federal and state tax breaks, which were significant, and my bill literally went down to fifteen dollars and change a month, including and, your Tesla. Yes, including my Tesla, my car, mm -hmm. and so. I think that because we are Hawaii, we're on an island, we have such great sun, we have ideal conditions for solar energy, that it makes a lot of sense for condos to explore, even though it may not pay for their full electric bill. If it's paying for the common elements or certain major components, you say, say your chiller air conditioning system or whatever, it's still saving some value or some money to the association. And I'm not convinced that uh, these tax credits will be there forever. You know, yes, and, and yes. that's, that's a concern. Yeah, the tax credit uh, got renewed by um, uh, President Obama recently, and think they're good for another four years, uh, at least. And uh, but you know, uh, there are ways of you can save substantial amounts of money with solar, and we can talk about it, and we can talk about how to finance for an association where the savings can be substantial. But I will say that if the decisions are not made properly and carefully by the associations, they can actually lose money. They can actually have a loss on a new solar system that they buy. Well, I've had that experience, and we'll get into that after our break that's coming up shortly on the financing and, and some of these risks. Um, but I can tell you that I know that there are associations that uh, lost money because, yeah. in my opinion, they should have hired professionals and gone through the protocol we're talking about here looking at all the energy issues, looking at their plan, plus how to pay for it, which certainly is, solar is not cheap. Yes. Because of the fact in the, uh, in the uh, scheme of this, this, is a big decision for the association, can have great results, but at the same time, if not properly vetted, can be a, uh, a real issue. Yeah, and, and financing, how they finance is such an important decision that it can lead to either them making money or losing money on the solar project. So right after this break, we're going to talk about financing and, 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 and all the free interest you give them for free financing. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be right back after the break. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not otherwise have met. 
helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're talking with Kareem Alana on the question, does solar make sense for condo associations? The big issue in Hawaii, energy saving, a big priority for our state. So we had just finished talking about why solar makes sense, but we both agreed it's expensive. Yes. What are the basic choices for how an association can pay for solar? Well, the way the solar economically makes sense, like I said, is that the tax credit, the 65% total tax credits that are available today get monetized, get used in some way by someone. And so there are two basic mechanisms. Rather, A, a you pay cash and you cannot manage, monetize those. B, you could do a PPA, a power purchase agreement, which is the most common method. And there's a third method, which is a lease lease, lease back. And that's, that's a third method that, that has more promise and, and is better than PPA. And I can talk about all Here, let's, those. Let's go back to the cash for a second. Because I think what you're, I hear you saying is because associations are nonprofits. Yes. They don't have the ability to take, take, take the tax benefits themselves. Yes. And so if they were to pay cash, they would be paying a lot more money for the system because they don't get the tax credits back. Is that Correct. Right? They're paying 100 cent on the dollar and then the return on investment is way low. And so the other two choices are, you get another party to either lease the system to you, and I'm assuming that party gets the tax benefits, right. and therefore the cost of the system is lower to you. Exactly. And third would be a power purchase agreement where they're actually becoming the utility provider for the association. But just to be clear, let's take a minute and have you describe what a power purchase agreement is. Okay. A power purchase agreement essentially is a, a, an agreement to purchase power from a third party, from a private source. They're installing the solar on your space. They own the equipment. It is theirs, not yours. And they are selling you power. And generally, they'll sell you the power at the, as a savings of 10 to 20 percent from what HECO charges you. And at the end of the 20 years, they own the equipment. It's a 20-year lease agreement for the power purchase. At the end of 20 years, they take the equipment off the roof and they take it back. Or you can buy it from them. But it's essentially a 20-year agreement to purchase power at a savings of 10 to 20%. So what happens if you make that agreement and you know, we've seen an incredible downward slide of utility rates. What happens in that case? Because it sounds to me you could make an agreement to pay 20% off today's rates or maybe a couple of years ago, which is yeah. even higher, yeah. and then all of a sudden the actual rates from the utility company are lower than your power purchase agreement. Yeah, exactly, and, and that has happened. In, in 2012, for example, uh, the utility rates were 28.75 cents, and people signed power purchase agreements uh, for 20% cheaper, and which was at 23 cents and they were saving 20% of the money. It was pretty good until the energy prices crashed, or oil prices crashed. And once they crashed, the, the uh, rates went down to 19 cents. And so now, instead of saving money, you're actually paying more to the power purchase people that you've agreed with than uh, what you started out with, 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 with HECO. You're better off staying with HECO. Yeah, just, uh, and I, I'll be candid with you. I'm not a big fan of power purchase agreements. I think the leasing option makes a lot more sense, but that's my personal view, and I'm sure solar people might argue with me. But to share an example, a factual example with you, uh, I knew of an association that uh, entered into a power purchase agreement. Uh, the fundamental mistake, because they didn't really have a design professional like yourself to monitor it, they kind of went with what the solar company said. And they designed the system based on the entire project, not the 28 buildings. Well, as it got into actual operation, 
certain buildings were designed better than others. So even under that scenario, forgetting the argument of the utility rates go up and down, certain buildings were costing them more money than it was originally, and certain buildings were costing them less money. But at the end of the day, when you added it all up, it was costing them more than the original uh, estimate because uh, they had to actually design this for each building independently. And unfortunately, that uh, design company or that solar company didn't take into consideration that HECO was going to make this on a building by building basis versus a project wide basis. So it became potentially litigation, although it was settled. Uh, and a lot of these issues were resolved in a way that the association would save money. But there are some real risks on power purchase agreements as uh, if there's much volatility in utility rates. Oh, oh yeah, no, absolutely. You know, in, in your example, the really the thing to do is to study every single meter on the 23 buildings and know exactly what the power consumption is for each meter and then exactly size the solar appropriately for every building. And we find these discrepancies all over the place. You know, some buildings have pumps in them, the others may not. Some buildings have, have better shading, the others have less shading, so they need more energy. And so they do vary. Um, but, uh, you know, talking about uh, PPAs, um, there are ways of negotiating with even the PPAs and, and making sure that if you do have a good PPA, that they, they follow the savings of the energy with HECO. Uh, and if they do that, sometimes they'll put a floor on it. Like in, in 2012, it was common to say that the floor where the, their rates will never go, they'll, the PPA rate will never go below 23 cents. Is it and fair to say the short summary of that, you better know what you're doing? <laughs> you better know what you're doing, you better know how to, how to negotiate these rates because you're literally buying and negotiating a power agreement for 20 years. You're locked in. And, and how does the leasing work? Now tell me about the leasing as a comparison. The leasing is a very interesting option. If someone like you know, a bank or a leasing company may come in and own the system and lease it to you for seven years, six to seven years minimum, it could be seven to 10 years where they lease it to you. In those seven years, they're basically monetizing the 65% tax credits because they need at least that much time to monetize it. And, and then they're simply leasing the principal back to you for seven years. And so your lease payment may be about the same as your HECO payment. At that point, you're not saving any money for the first seven years. But after seven years, you've paid off the system, and then may maybe there's a 10 or 20% residual on the lease to buy out the equipment outright. And now you own it. And now that you own it for the next 13 years or next 23 years of the solar last you 30 years, you're making a hell of a lot of money. And I can give you an example. If you did a PPA and everything worked out and HECO rates didn't go up and down and, and, uh, and, and things were okay, uh, on, on a 500 kilowatt system, for example, in, in 20 years, you could wind up saving $780,000 on a 500 kilowatt system if you had that large of a system installed. Uh, with a, a lease in the 20 year period, in the same 20 years, you would save three and a half million dollars. Huge difference. And uh, so lease, while you have to suffer through not making much of a cash flow, in some instances making it a negative cash flow, a slight negative cash flow for the first few years. And as rates climb up, that negative cash flow goes away, may go away. And however, the first seven years are tight. You're not there to save in the first seven years. You're there to save in the next 23 years. Yeah, my experience in the leasing is, in, um, and I'm not an expert at this, but there's capital leases with like $1 buyouts. It's my understanding that the leasing companies can't give those to no, associations cannot. because it won't qualify to, for them to get the tax credits. Okay. So you have some kind of buyout. buyout provisions of it. But, you know, frankly speaking, uh, a solar system 10 years from now, with the changes of technology and everything, it's probably not going to have that much of a, of a market value as a buyout anyway. You can't contractually have that committed to but it probably doesn't have that much residual value anyway at the end of the 10 years, yeah. where you get into a much little tighter circumstance when you have a 20-year power purchase agreement. It's kind of like pay me now or pay me later. Right. Pay a little bit more now to save three and a half million right. versus pay a little less now and only save 785,000. Or lose money. You or could, on a PPA, you could wind up in the negative. You could wind up actually 
breaking even or, or, or losing money in the first seven years. Uh, and that has happened over, over the course of the last five years because of the energy prices falling. People are actually overpaying right now that, that got solar as a result of the PPA. But in, in a lease, you're right, you cannot have a dollar lease. You have to have uh, a fair market buyout. And you, you generally, we're looking at 20% of the cost of the solar. And that 20%, you, the association can either fund it themselves because all of a sudden they're paying nothing for electricity. And the stream of money that they start saving is huge. So they could simply fund it out of their pocket if they have the money or borrow from the bank to fund it to, to buy it out. And, but the savings at that point, the electricity bill is zero. Are there other considerations in planning this out, like battery storage systems or other types of storage systems? I know we only have a couple minutes left on the show. So can you briefly comment, are there other considerations, such as battery storage or something else, that they, they might want to also include in their thought wave? Yeah, the battery storage prices are, are coming down. And uh, so they're becoming more and more economical. There are also the same tax credits that are available for battery storage. So battery storage is a viable option, but still quite expensive. Uh, another form of storage that's actually very popular and gaining in popularity in Hawaii is uh, ice storage. Because we're chilling buildings 24-7, if you had ice storage, which, which is essentially taking the power of solar, the excess power you're generating in the morning and the daytime, you're storing it in the form of ice, blocks and you know, large chunks of ice, that you're then using for cooling the whole day or during the off, off, off peak times. And so you're, you're, that becomes a storage system. And you're storing ice instead of storing in a lithium battery. And there are now small units made where you can put it on a rooftop for, for like a, a townhome. And the townhome could essentially store enough ice right on the rooftop for their unit and, and utilize that, that power back into just chilling. I guess I'll cancel my order for 200,000 AA batteries and <laughs> to help my house in case my PV goes down. But uh, I want to thank you for being here. No, the one thing you have taught me today is this is a complex technical subject. And as a board, you should hire professionals to properly evaluate this because there's as many risks where you could lose money. Yeah. Just the word solar sends the message, save money. Yeah. But unless you do it right for an association, you could lose money. It's a risk fee. That's right. So I want to thank all of you for listening to Condo Insider today. Again, we invite you to come back next Thursday at 3 o'clock to learn more about association living. And we thank Kareem Alana, President of Alana Buick Burris, for being here and sharing this insight with us today. Aloha. Thank you.